Hello everyone, and welcome to another audiobook. This is the final one in Bunny Call. Um, this technically would have been the last story um, in the Fazbear Frights universe if uh, if the next few books weren't announced. Anyway, uh, this is the man in one in room 1280. I am so excited for this story. Um, this one seems like it will be the most mysterious. It seems like it will be the one with the most lore in it. Um, I've seen a few comments go around saying the man in room 1280 is the most like jam-packed one. It has the most uh, in it and um, it, it will tell us a lot, basically. I will say it is the longest story uh, <laughs> of the three in this book. Uh, it is about 100 pages long. Uh, well, a hundred, a page being like this, so like, I'll have to press this 50 times. Anyway, um, if you enjoy this, then please make sure you subscribe, uh, give this video a like. You know that you know the stuff. Um, I'm gonna be sat here probably for two and a half hours or something trying to read this book, but uh, we'll get there eventually. Um, I will say, um, I am reacting to this with you guys too, um, so. Yeah, I've never read this before. We're just going to get straight into it. Standing at the smudged window in room 1280, the nurses deliberately kept their backs to their patient and watched the priest approach the hospital. They all breathed as shallowly as they could, trying to ignore the sensation of being observed and judged. He has to be warned, one of the nurses said. He won't believe us, the second one said. The head nurse's face was hard as stone. Then he'll find out the hard way. Arthur pedalled his vin vintage bicycle, Ruby, through the stone archway at the base of the drive leading up to Heracles Ho Hospital. Her it looks like Hercules, and I really want to say Her. Can I just say Hercules? Am I allowed to just say Hercules? I'm going to say Hercules. <laughs> um, the archway, like much of the hospital itself, was engulfed in thick green ivy. The bicycle's antique balloon tires chuffed at the moist pavement, spitting fallen leaves in their wake. A black SUV passed Arthur, and the little boy in the back seat turned to stare, watching Arthur until the SUV rounded the drive's curve for the columned entrance of the imposing medical centre. Arthur knew that he and Ruby made a striking picture. Arthur didn't have to wear the long, flowing black cassock that fluttered out behind Ruby, but he liked wearing it. It buoyed him made him feel like he was being lifted by angel's wings, or maybe he just thought it looked good, in which case he needed to do better with his first deadly sin. Pride. <laughs> uh, Ruby was evidence of that as well. A priest didn't need a fully restored 1953 bicycle with gleaming chrome fenders and shiny red paint, but a priest could enjoy what he had, couldn't he? Ruby was a gift from a dying man, how could Arthur refuse to accept her? Arthur smiled to himself. The truth was that neither his or Ruby's appearance interested him much. He was really just a meek man who allowed himself a couple of indulgent flares because they made him happy. A few drops of rain hit Arthur's face, making him regret leaving his felt uh, Saturno hat sized large, fit enough, sized large enough to fit over his red bicycle helmet at home. Sorry, It's going to rain, Arthur's housekeeper Peggy had warned him. The sun loiters behind every cloud, Peggy, he told her. It just needs a little face to coax it out. Peggy had laughed at him, as she often did. Arthur glanced up at the ro roiling steel grey sky. Layered beneath, behind the grey were inky wisps of cirrus clouds that curled like beckoning fingers. Arthur put his head down and pedalled faster. Just another couple hundred feet and he'd be under the hospital's portico sheltered beneath the dubious protection of the stone Cerberus statue <laughs> sorry I'm really bad at reading that hunched atop the columns at the hospital's entrance Hercules hospital <laughs> was one of the more imposing hospitals to which Arthur had been called the structure had been built centuries before using rough hewn stone painstakingly extracted from the local quarry at the cost of countless men's lives, and it held generations of pain, struggle and sorrow within its walls. But Arthur knew it also held 
hope and love and joy. That was always what he chose to see. When he looked up from the road, Arthur's gaze was drawn to the sky above the hospital. He smiled. One streaming golden ray of sunshine touched the backside of the red tile roof, spearing the blackness and slicing through the grey clouds pressing down on the building. See, Ruby? Arthur said. Like I said, it's just... it, it needs a little face. Ruby didn't respond, but Arthur had to laugh at himself when, just as he pulled up to the bike rack under the portico, rain began to fall in heavy drops. They splattered the pavement and filled the air with a sweet ozone smell. Haha, <laughs> ozone, that's me! <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, rain is good too, he said as he flipped up the hem of his cassock and got off Ruby's cushy leather seat. Excuse me, father? Were you talking to me? Someone said. Arthur turned around to find a young woman in a rain slicker, her blonde hair pulled into a taut ponytail, juggling a pink backpack, an orange tote bag, and a red umbrella. She had a square face and a wide mouth that was spared from looking masculine by her lively blue eyes and the bright makeup she wore. She smiled at Arthur, Arthur tentatively. Hello, young lady, Arthur said. He gave her a half bow. Arthur had turned just 47 the previous spring. But he looked older because his hair had turned mostly grey a decade before, and deep emotions had carved lines on his face. Recently, he decided he was now old enough to refer to younger women as young lady. When he was a young man himself, he was always befuddled, but befuddled by what to call women. Miss and ma'am seemed to offend more often than not, for reasons that confused Arthur. Hey, I get that, I get that when serving people. I can say sir, but I can't say miss. Hey you, was always appropriate. Hi, the young woman said. Arthur had out his hand. I'm Father Blythe. Inwardly, he cringed at the formality. He preferred being called by his first name, but the bishop, but his bishop had made it abundantly clear that only so many of Arthur's idiosyncrasies, <laughs> idiosyncrasies? what is that, would be tolerated. I'm Mia, the young woman said. She shook Arthur's hand. Mia's hand was small, soft, and very, very cold. Arthur held it slightly longer than he should have, willing some of his warmth into the chill of her fingertips. Mia Fremont, Mia said when Arthur released her hand. I'm a nurse here, or I'm going to be. Or, I mean, I am. Well, as of 15 minutes from now, I am, I guess. Or I am because I was already hired. Mia's voice was mellow and sweet and filled with en endearing uncertainty. Arthur smiled. Congratulations, he said. He looked at Mia more closely and saw that a dark blue nurse's uniform was hiding under a yellow rain slicker. Um, thanks? Mia looked at the hospital's entrance and frowned. Her lower lip quivered for just a second. Arthur pulled the bicycle chain and lock from the satchel he wore slung across his body. He bent over to secure Ruby. He was for all for faith, but prudence... Prudence had a place in the world too. Sorry, there's a lot of words I don't know. Scott has become a great writer. Um, a car pulled in under the portico and let out a large woman barking orders at a smaller woman who followed her into the hospital. An older couple walked slowly toward the entrance hand in hand. A janitor sat on a nearby bench staring at his feet. Two fat pigeons hopped along the walkway pecking at invisible morsels. The rain was coming down harder now. It th thrummed on the pavement and hissed under the tires of passing cars. A metallic trickling sound came from the downspouts at the bottom edge of the hospital's columns. Arthur straightened and realised Mia was still standing next to him. She stared at the hospital entrance. Are you okay, Mia? Arthur said. Mia blinked. <laughs> what, me? Yeah, sure, I mean, I will be. I hope, yeah, well, yes, I'm better than I was. I. She stopped and turned. Why is the dog that guards Hades up there? She pointed at the portico ceiling. Arthur frowned. He wasn't sure of that himself. In Greek mythology, Cerberus was tasked with, tasked with preventing the dead from leaving the underworld. Arthur didn't know whether the Cer Cerberus statue was meant to suggest it was going to keep the dead from entering the hospital or whether it was going to keep the people who died in the hospital from moving on. The symbolism was made even murkier by the hospital's name, Heracles, the son of Zeus and Alcmene. I wish I knew uh, Greek mythology, but I, I don't, <laughs> was a mythological hero. One of his twelve labours was capturing Cerberus. It seems like this story is going to be very um, religious and mythological. Um, it, a lot of it's going to be based on that. I wonder if we'll be able to find clues 
uh, to, to FNAF with kind of Greek mythology and uh, and religion because Scott is religious so um, yeah the the hospital's name and statuary left Arthur wondering if he was in a place of good or evil either way he had a job to do I'm not exactly sure Arthur said but it's just a statue Mia didn't seem convinced Arthur glanced at his plain black banded watch shall we he indicated the hospital's automatic sliding doors which he had, which had swished open and closed at least a dozen times since Arthur had locked up Ruby Mia left lifted her chin yes I guess I have to she glanced at her own watch I made sure to get here early and I'm going to be late if I don't go in now Arthur took a step but Mia didn't Arthur stopped he wanted to get on with why he was here but Mia seemed to need help and helping was what Arthur did do I perceive a hesitation Arthur asked. My, me aside, this job wasn't my first choice. I wanted the position at Glendale, you know. Arthur nodded. He visited Glendale Hospital often, and he had to admit that he preferred it as well. He only visited Her Heracles. Sorry, I have to stop every time I want to say Heracles. Uh, the one, the only, the one time so far, just the previous week, and he already knew this wasn't going to be his favourite place. But Arthur couldn't be choosy. He was to he was called to where he was called. Heracles is actually far more modern than Glendale, Arthur offered as encouragement. Ten years before, Heracles had been bought by a millionaire, who practically gutted the old hospital before renovating it into the state-of-the-art medical centre. The renovation made sure to keep all of the original exterior, architectural details, and even the hospital's interior, which is designed to be reminiscent of an older era, with crisp white walls, black and white tiled floors, thick baseboards, and crown moulding. The result was a sort of time whiplash, where cutting-edge technology shared space with crystal chandeliers and wrought iron scrollwork. I know, Mia said, but she sighed again. I guess it's better than the prison hospital. That's where I was before. Arthur was surprised. Really? I never saw you there. You out to the prison? I go where I'm needed. Arthur said. A siren screamed, squawked, then burbled into abrupt silence as an ambulance rocked to the stop in front of the hospital's emergency entrance, fifty feet, fifty feet from where Arthur and Mia stood. Shall we go inside? Arthur suggested. He put his hand lightly on Mia's upper back in an attempt to propel her forward. It didn't work. Mia glabbed grabbed the sleeve of Arthur's cassock. What do you mean? You go where you're needed. Arthur stepped back to avoid two teenage girls carrying a bouquet of balloons that looked big enough to pick them up and carry them away. He motioned for Mia to join them, to join him next to a cluster of panical hydrangeas, the, <laughs> the plant's large white cylindrical flowers hanging on valiantly, uh, even though early fall's chill pressed upon them. Once tucked out of the way, Arthur faced Mia. I give the dying their last rites. Mia shivered. All oh, right, oh, I see. But you seem so cheerful, so kind. How can you be that way and be around death? Arthur smiled. Death isn't a sad thing, it's a transition. And I'm kind of like a tour guide for making people, for people making the transition. Or maybe more like a traveling companion. Instead of letting fear take people away, I'd step in and take fear's place. Once fear is gone, the soul can reach the other side in peace. Mia gazed into Arthur's eyes, and he wondered what she saw there. He perceived his eyes to be the boring brown eyes of a simple man, but what did others see? Arthur waited. Sure, he was still needed here more than he was needed in the hospice wing that had summoned him, at least for another moment. Finally, Mia took a deep breath and nodded. I'm glad I met you, father. Me too, Mia. She held up her arm. Elva out. Well, could you escort me to my first day on the job then? I've been assigned to the hospice wing and I bet that's where I'm going. Arthur smiled and took Mia's arm. Indeed I am. Mia, let's go. At the curved desk at the nurse's station in the hospice wing, Arthur passed Mia off to a tall, sharp-edged woman with too many teeth and a dark-eyed gaze that unsettled Arthur. Nurse Ackerman was the head of the hospice wing. And Arthur had met her last week when he came to introduce himself. He'd admonished himself for disliking her immediately, although to be fair, he doubted many human beings uh, did like her. He said a silent prayer for Mia and for Nurse Ackerman. Then he followed the nurse's rigid, bony back down the wide hall. 
As they passed open doorways, Arthur occasionally glanced into rooms when he felt moved to do so. Some rooms felt heavy and somber, and Arthur said a prayer for the patients and families in them. Some rooms felt ebullient, e ebullient sometimes even effervescent. That's it, that's the word. Uh, the people in those rooms didn't need Arthur's help. They understood the truth of the journey ahead. He prayed for them anyway. You can never have too much support. Nurse Ackerman led Arthur past room after room. So far down the long hallway, he wondered if they'd somehow passed through an invisible barrier into another hospital. The longer they walked, the denser the air felt. The worse it smelled too. Arthur was used to the hospital smells of bitter medicine, sharp urine, fetid waste, and pungent antiseptics. But this was something else, something acrid and ancient. The patient you are about to see, Nurse Ackerman said, is a special case. Okay, okay. Arthur almost jumped out of his skin when Nurse Ackerman opened her mouth. He was already surprised by her escort down the hall. He hadn't expected her to speak, too. She'd barely spoken to him the last time he was here, and then only to give him a room number and send him on his way. Her voice was as sharp as her appearance and it held a disturbing sibilance that made the hair stand up on the back of Arthur's neck. Every consonant sounded like it was being spit on and then stabbed with a forked tongue. She continued, The man has been on life support for years. How many years? Arthur asked. Nurse Ackerman's shoulder blades rose in annoyance. Irrelevant, she snapped. For God's sake! <laughs> Ackerman! Come on, I want the law! <laughs> Um, he's been here all this time, Nurse Ackerman ignored Arthur, ignored Arthur, when the state finally took him off light support. Why did the state do that? Where's his family? Nurse Ackerman whirled around and impaled Arthur with a searing look. He has no family, she nearly shouted. Her tone suggested Arthur should have known that somehow. Yes, he'd done a little research on this place, talked to a couple of colleagues, but he hadn't heard of any special case. Nurse Ackerman rubbed at the large mole under her left eye. She took a breath, turned away from Arthur, and resumed walking. Arthur glanced back over his shoulder to be sure he was still in Heracles Hospital and would be able to find his way back to Ruby. At the moment, his bicycle seemed impossibly far away. As I was saying, the state took him off life support. Nurse Ackerman continued with the air of someone long-suffering. Even though, even so, he wouldn't die. Oh no, this is, this is, this is William Afton, isn't it? Um, a miracle, Arthur said, a quick prayer of thanks. Hardly, the words sounded like a shot, reverberating off the stark white walls and closed doors around them. Closed doors? Arthur looked at the old-fashioned, wide, six-panelled dark wood doors with frosted glass windows. All the doors were closed on this end of the hall, and none of the panels revealed light from within the rooms. Why? Arthur opened his mouth to ask then thought better of it, and remained silent. Nurse Ackerman stopped before a door that looked strangely darker than all the other doors they had passed, but the glass panel indicated the room's light was on. He glanced up to check the overhead lights. Was one of them out? Before he could confirm his suspicion, Nurse Ackerman uh, pushed the door open. He's in here, she said unnecessarily. Arthur glanced at the number by the door, 1280. As soon as the door was opened, the origin of the smell Arthur had noticed was obvious. It came from wherever lay in the hospital bed on the other side of the room. Up close, the smell was even more noxious, and it was more easily discerned. It was a smoky smell, but not like any smoky smell Arthur had ever encountered. It was like smelling burnt meat, smouldering plastic, and molten steel all at once. Interesting molten steel. Uh, Arthur picked out the disturbing odours of carbon and sulphur. What was in this room? Arthur didn't have long to ponder the question because Nurse Ackerman stepped, inside, uh, stepped aside and made a sweeping hand gesture at the bed in front of her. She reminded Arthur of those women on game shows, the one who elaborately indicated potential prizes. Lying there was the man Arthur had come to see. Arthur stopped breathing. He clutched the door jam. He ordered his legs to keep him holding up. This patient could not be called a, a, a prize, except perhaps in hell. Arthur had seen a lot of horrible things in his tenure as a priest. He'd been to car crashes and airplane crashes and all manner of natural disasters. He'd prayed over people missing limbs, missing eyes, missing large chunks of their bodies. He'd seen so much disfigurement and 
physical horror that he would have, until this moment, been fairly confident in saying he'd seen every misery that could be thrust upon the human body. But this... It wasn't the appearance of the man alone that took Arthur's breath away. It was... what? Not the smell? The incongruity? <laughs> I just said that wrong, didn't I? Incongruity? Yes, not incongruity. Uh, the impossibility? Arthur's brain begged for oxygen, and he remembered to inhale. <laughs> Sucked in a lungful, a lungful of rancid, uh, decay-tinged air, Arthur swiped at the tears that suddenly filled his eyes. They weren't emotional tears. The tears were reacting to a puzzling acidity in the room. Arthur worked his tongue around in his mouth, gathering up enough saliva to speak. He looked at Nurse Ackerman and noticed that her eyes were squinted and her nose was more pinched than usual. What's his name? Arthur asked. We don't know. Oh, come on, Nurse. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The th <laughs> oh, no family has claimed him. He has no records. What about fingerprints? Arthur asked, and then immediately realised what a stupid question it was. Nurse Ackerman let out a gurgling snort that Arthur supposed passed for a laugh. A DNA sample was taken, but it matches no individual in existing DNA databases, she said. Arthur nodded. As you can see, Nurse Ackerman continued, he has brain function. She gestured him uh, at a monitor upon which a series of jagged green lines played out across the dark screen. That's an, uh, that's a REM sleep pattern. Ah, oh, yes. Yes, REM sleep. Yes, okay. I should have said REM then. I, I know what REM sleep is. Why didn't I not say REM? That's a REM sleep pattern, Arthur stared. He'd take her word for it, as the tall, spiky lines meant nothing to him. According to Dr. Henner, the hospital's sleep expert, that particular REM pattern indicates nightmares. Horrific nightmares. Okay, I think we're talking about Ultimate Custom Night here. I think. <laughs> Arthur's gaze, which had been locked on the man in the bed, whipped to Nurse Ackerman. Was there just a little too much glee in the tone she used for horrific nightmares? Yes. Her mouth twitched at the corner as if she wanted to smile. Arthur frowned and she raised an eyebrow at him. An overhead speaker, right outside the door of room 1280, blasted out. Nurse Ackerman, please come to room 907. I'll leave you to it, she said. But I'll be back. There's more for us to discuss. What they, they were discussing? Arthur didn't feel like he was discussing anything. All he was doing was trying to accept what his senses were telling him. He was also trying to remember his training, his humanity and his dis decency. Nurse Ackerman's footsteps slapped the door as she retweet, re retweeted. Yes, <laughs> she's tweeting. <laughs> she retreated down the hall. Arthur didn't let go of the door jam. He knew he needed to. He had to enter the room, but not yet. First, he wanted to see if he could get his brain to understand his fa the facts his eyes reported as being real. A disconnect had to be bridged before he could step into the situation and do something, anything, besides whimper like a small child. The man... Really? Could Arthur truly call this a man? Wasn't it more corpse than man? Well, no. Some of the facts weren't consistent with the designation of corpse. The REM monitor, for example. So is he in a coma? Like... No. Uh, fact 1. The man appeared to be burned to a crisp. There we go. There it is. Burned to a crisp. Uh, what lay in the bed in room 1280 resembled a human being only vaguely in that it had the requirement Requi requisite shape <laughs> requisite um, it had a head, a torso, two arms and two legs there, the similarity to humans ended uh, fact 2, the burning had been so pervasive so complete, that the only thing remaining was essentially a charred skeleton almost, actually Arthur wished the man was just a charred skeleton if he were simply blackened human bones he'd been easier to look at but the ruinous fire damage could be seen throughout the body Although he had no hair, the man did have skin, or was it skin? Arthur had never seen anything like the demis on this man. Uh, it looked like fire had scorched away so many layers that his skin was just an ashy covering, um, far too translucent, translucent for comfort. Arthur guessed that fire had s uh, siph siphoned, siphoned 
had gotten rid of all of the moisture from the body's covering, leaving it with extensive cracks like the surface of the dried up lake bed. Through those cracks, Arthur caught unwelcome glimpses of uncharred tissue. Fact three, the man's organs worked, at least the ones Arthur could see, oh my gosh, ooh, uh, and that in itself was repellent in ways Arthur had never experienced before. Through the translucent skin's cracks, Arthur could literally watch this man's desiccated and blackened heart pumping. Oh, he could see the heat shriveled lungs expanding and contracting. He could glimpse the seared kidneys and a bladder so carbonized it seemed like it was about to collapse in on itself. Fact four, the man had no face. A hole in his skull indicated where his nose used to be. Dark cavernous pits lacking eyes looked at nothing. A toothless mouth gaped without lips to protect it. Fact 5. The man did have a brain. The REM pattern suggested this, and unfortunately, Arthur could see bits of grey matter between the cracks in the man's burnt cranium. Oh no! Uh, fact 6. The man had blood flowing in his veins. What looked like scorched worms creeped above and through uh, toasted tissues, pulsing under the skin and around the crisp skeleton. Arthur assumed these were veins. The blood on the sheets seemed to confirm it. Fact 7. And this was the most disturbing fact of all. It was the culmination of the other facts. It was the fact that Arthur couldn't fit into the understanding of the world. His understanding of the universe. His understanding to the power that governed everything. This was the fact that this man was alive against all odds. What was he? Arthur returned to his original question. Was this patient a man? Again, brain function would suggest he was. But what truly determined humanity and life? The soul. Ho ho! Did this gruesome collection of bloody, incinerated human remains have a soul? Arthur decided it was time to enter the room. After all, it was his job to find out. Peeling his fingers from the door jam and rubbing them to put life back into them, he took a hesitant step forward. Arthur could hear the suck and rush of his respiration, even over the sound of the monitor's rhythmic beats and the wheeze and the click of the man's and implausible breathing. Stopping, Arthur looked around the room for the first time since Nurse Ackerman had opened the door. There wasn't much to see. The room was white-walled, like every other room in Heracles Hospital. Yes, I didn't pause. Uh, the man's bed set, sat in the middle of the room, surrounded by monitors. On one side of the bed, an IV pole held one pouch of, what, fluids? Nutrients? Did this man need either? An IV line ran into a port taped to the man's radius or his ulna. Arthur couldn't tell from where he stood. Even though he wasn't on life support, the man did have electrical leads affixed to his head and his heart. It was surreal to see this life-affirming equipment attached to what looked like something in a morgue. The man even had a pulse, pulse ox monitor on his left index finger bone. How was that working? Pushed off to one side of the bed, a high-backed padded vinyl visitor's chair was next to an empty rolling tray. The chair was positioned so its user could see out of the narrow window that overlooked Heracles Hospital's um, parking lot. The wall opposite the window held a whiteboard. In other rooms, you might see medication schedules written there, but this one was clean. Next to the whiteboard, an LED x-ray viewer hung on the wall. When Arthur stepped over to the window, he looked out and saw the long driveway he and Ruby had pedalled up just 20 minutes before. Why did it feel like it had happened in another reality, maybe in another lifetime? Standing by the window, Arthur suddenly felt an icy rawness bore a hole through the middle of his back. The feeling was so powerful that Arthur spun around, awkwardly reaching behind himself and trying to rub the assaulted area. What was that? It felt like it had some it felt it had felt like something was trying to reach into his soul. You felt it, didn't you? Nurse Ackerman was back. Felt what? Arthur asked. You know what? Arthur ignored the nurse and sat down in the vinyl chair. He couldn't look at the man quite, again quite yet, so he looked at Nurse Ackerman. Her uniform pants were too short. He could see her black shot socks and an inch or so of white skin between them and the hem of her pants. We'd be rem remiss if we didn't warn you, she said. We? Myself, Nurse Thomas and Nurse Colton. We've worked in the hospice wing the longest. We know what he, she wrinkled her nose to the word, what that is. And what is it? He, he, Arthur stammered. Evil, Father Blythe. 
evil, pure and simple. Arthur shook his head. Just because he looks like that, that's not the evil, Nurse Ackerman cut in. She waved her hand at the revolting mass in the bed. Then what is it? It's what inside of that. Inside? As in under the bones? In the organs? Nurse Ackerman flicked her hand as if Arthur was asking stupid questions. Who cares? It's in there. She shook her head and sighed. I knew you wouldn't believe me. Opening a file Arthur hadn't even noticed she was holding, she crossed to the x-ray viewer. There she slapped three brain scan images into place and pointed. Look, Arthur gingerly... Is that gingerly? <laughs> he was being ginger. Arthur gingerly stepped around the, um, the man's bed as if it might attack him. Nurse Ackerman lifted her chin toward the brain scans. See? There. She pointed at one part of the scan. And there. Arthur leaned forward. He had no idea what he was looking at. I'm sorry. You need to explain. Nurse Ackerman sighed. These are coronal, sagittal, and cross-sectional scans of the man's brain. You can see the same thing in all of them. Arthur couldn't. So he said, you need to tell me what we're seeing. She sighed again. Our brains have four lobes. The frontal, parietal, occipital, I think I said that right. I have done this in psychology. And temporal. Um, she tapped areas on each of the scans. Unless a brain has a tumour or damage from a trauma like an injury or a stroke, signals in each of the four lobes should be relatively coherent. Although this man shows no sign of tumours or brain injury, the lobe signals aren't coherent. She tapped the scans again. Arthur focused on the sagittal scan, which showed the man's brain in profile. There he could see what looked like two different colours or textures in each area. He pointed at them. Is that what you're talking about? Nurse Ackerman nodded. The doctors believe each lobe of this man's brain has two distinct electromagnetic signals. This is unheard of. What does it mean? Arthur asked. Nurse Ackerman made a clucking sound. The doctors claim they don't know, but we know. We? She gave him an eye roll that clearly indicated he was daft. Me and my fellow nurses. What do you think it is? We don't think. We know. What do you know? Two signals. She, dabbed, she jabbed each loop. Means two living things. Are you kidding me? For goodness sake. <laughs> uh, two entities. They're both vying for control of the brain. That's why they're present in all of the lobes. But they're at odds with each other. We think they're tormenting each other. Arthur had no idea what to say to that, so he blurted out the first thing that came to his mind. Where's the evil? Nurse Ackerman threw up her hands. Then she waved at the scans. There! How can one brain have competing signals? It's the very playground of evil! Arthur thought maybe Nurse Ackerman should visit a different wing of the hospital. Perhaps the psych <laughs> psychiatric wing. But no, that wasn't kind. He should have more empathy for the woman. Anyone who was taking care of the man in this, woman in this room was entitled to have a crazy theory or two. At least she and the other nurses had a theory. Arthur had nothing. Nothing but his faith. Every man has good in him, Arthur said. That's not a man. Okay. Every living creature has good in it. Nurse Ackerman reached out and yanked the scans from the viewing box. I knew you wouldn't listen. Arthur turned and looked at the that man in the bed. It's my job to see the good. Nurse Ackerman only shook her head and walked out of the room. I... I'm confused kind of already. So there's, there's two living creatures inside this man? There's two souls. Oh, not again. I hate these kind of stories. I, I hate the fact that two souls are now able to fit in one body. Anyway, okay. <laughs> Mia pulled the flimsy beige plastic chair out from one of the round tables in the staff break room. The room contained a small fridge, a counter, a microwave, and half a dozen tables with chairs. It smelled like barbecue sauce and spoiled che cheese. If Mia hadn't been so hungry, the, w the smells would have ruined her appetite. But she'd worked up an appetite so strong she could have eaten her lunch in a sewage treatment plant. Mia opened her bag lunch and pulled out the turkey sandwich her boyfriend had made her that morning. He was so sweet. She set up her paper, paper bag thrill her uh, in front of her and popped open a cola. She took a bite of the sandwich and washed it down with cola, 
noticing the do's and don'ts posters tacked all over the plain white walls. They didn't make her feel welcome, nor did they make her feel any better about her decision to take this job. It was a stepping stone, right? That's what her boyfriend said. Keep your nose clean, do a good job, and you'll be moving on up in no time, he said. Mia took a bite of a sandwich and chewed appreciatively. That's when her new boss, Nurse Ackerman, and the other two bigwig nurses on the hospice wing marched in. Mia immediately dropped her head and pretended to be reading. How long has he been in there? Nurse Thomas asked, plopping into a chair at the table behind Mia. Mia could smell her lavender heavy perfume. Father Blythe? Nurse, Ack Ack Nurse Ackerman's- I have a- I have a-, a uh, what's it called? Uh, a lisp. <laughs> A lisp, because I said Father Blythe, and I said Nurse Ackerman. Um, all morning, moron. Um, two chairs scraped the floor, and Mia knew the other two nurses had sat too. Nurse Colton was right behind Mia. Already, Mia had noticed several times that Nurse Colton needed a stronger deodorant. Mia had already planned on listening to whatever the nurses said, but when she heard Father Blythe's name combined with moron, she tuned in to more closely. Father Blythe was the very nice priest who had walked up to her to start a new job. He had been so kind and patient with her. He was cute too, not in a boyfriend kind of way, but in an adorable old man kind of way. Short and slight, with thick wavy grey hair and gentle brown eyes, Father Blythe looked like the grandfather Mia wished she had. She liked him immediately and it made her mad to hear someone call him names. Nurse Ackerman was the moron. Mia had learned early on in nursing school that not all nurses were nice. Some were so unpleasant, Mia wondered why they'd gone into nursing in the first place. But Nurse Ackerman was the worst she had met so far. The woman was just plain icky. Never smiling, stalking around, firing orders, Nurse Ackerman showed immediately that Mia wasn't going to get anything from a new boss except for criticism and judgement. And what was it with using last names? We use surnames on this wing, Nurse Fremont. Um. Nurse Ackerman said when Mia had introduced herself with the friendly, I'm Mia. Fine. Mia didn't want to be friends anyway. And then there was Nurse Thomas. She was nice enough, but there wasn't much there, there. Mia wondered how Nurse Thomas managed to keep her job. Round and sweet looking with curly greying black hair, Nurse Thomas looked like she should be at home baking cookies. She called everyone sweetie and she loved to pat people on the back. But she wouldn't remember to bring her feet along if they weren't attached at the ankles. Already that morning, Mia had spent what seemed like half her shift finding things that Nurse Thomas had lost. Nurse Colton was the only reasonable, reasonably normal nurse Mia had met so far. In her mid-forties, Mia guessed, Nurse Colton was an athletic-looking woman with brown hair chopped short and as boyish cut and a great tan. She was nice enough, Mia supposed, but she was too serious, as if she'd something heavy on her mind. Mia picked up a sandwich to take another bite. What did you tell him? Nurse Colton asked Miss a uh, Nurse Ackerman. What we know. I told him there's evil inside the man. Mia held the sandwich in front of her face. Evil? He refuses to see it, of course. Nurse Ackerman said dismissively. Well, we know better, don't we, sweeties? Nurse Thomas said. I can barely think about it without being so scared I want to throw up. Yes, we know better, Nurse Colton said. Nurse Ackerman got up and plucked a plastic bag of carrots from the fridge. No wonder she's so skinny, Mia thought. He's idealistic, Nurse Ackerman said. I am too, Nurse Thomas said. But when the writing's on the wall, it's on the wall. Mia took a bite of her sandwich and willed herself to be invisible. He's new, Nurse Colton said. He'll catch on. I'm not so sure. He's determined, Nurse Ackerman said. Time will tell, Nurse Thomas said. It always does. It always does. The nurses chatted for a few more minutes about some of the patients Mia had already met. She wondered about the man with evil inside. Was he a patient? He must be if Father Blythe was here visiting him. Or maybe Father Blythe was visiting someone else. Mia listened, but she never heard another word about the priest. Did she need to find him and warn him? But warn him about what? It sounded like he'd already been warned and didn't believe the warning. Arthur had been sitting in the vinyl visiting chair for over three hours. During that time, he'd accomplished little, except that now he could look at the man in the bed without nearly losing his breakfast. This made him feel slightly better about himself, but the self-congratulation was unearned. Arthur knew his belly was empty now, so he had no breakfast to lose, and he had no business being pleased either. He hadn't, been able, he hadn't yet been able to approach the man's bed. 
he was still completely repulsed, not b just by the man, but by the bloody sheets he lay on and whatever it was that was leaking from the tubes that snaked out from underneath him, attached to heaven's new wear. Those tubes curled off the bed and ran into bags hanging from the bed's frame. Arthur could hear the body waste dribbling into pr plastic bags that were regrettably see-through. Arthur didn't venture a look. Ever since Nurse Ackerman had left, Arthur hadn't said one word out loud. All he'd done was stare and pray. Now he decided he had something to he had to do something else. What if the man wanted to communicate? Arthur had no idea how or even whether whether it would top, whether it was possible. But he had to give the man a chance. Sitting in this chair five feet from the bed was not giving the man a chance. Arthur took a deep breath and scooted the chair a foot a foot closer. Yes, that's very brave. Arthur muttered to himself. He chuckled. One of the monitors let out an unusual beep, or rather a normal bleep, at an unexpected time. In three hours, Arthur had learned the monitor's rhythm, and just how that, and just now that rhythm had varied. Was it because he talked? Breathing shallowly through his mouth, because the closer he got to the man, the worse the smells were, Arthur dragged the chair nearer to the bed. It made a screeching sound on the floor, but the monitors didn't react to that. Arthur got the chair to within a foot of the bed, just outside the distance he thought the man could reach. He knew it wasn't friendly or caring, but Arthur wasn't ready to risk touching it or being touched by the man yet. In the three hours he'd sat here, he'd realised that a part of him, a truly traitorous part of him, half believed what Nurse Ackerman had said. Was something evil keeping the man alive? Just thinking that disturbed him greatly. How could he be a priest and believe that good, uh, that evil had more power over the body than good? What if something good was keeping the man alive? Wasn't that more believable? Of course it was, he told himself. It was divine energy that created worlds. Couldn't that energy sustain life beyond the time when life was viable? Certainly it could. Although Arthur's logical side argued, divine energy wasn't the only kind of energy in the world. Stop it, Arthur admonished himself. And the monitors beeped out a rhythm again. You can hear me? Arthur asked, scooching the chair closer to the bed in spite of himself. The monitor's beep stuttered. The man in the bed didn't move. Arthur leaned forward. My name's Father Blythe. No, forget that. My name is Arthur. Is there anything, is there anything that I can do for you? I want to help. The monitor's beeped erratically for several seconds. Arthur said a silent prayer, asking for strength. Divest me of habitual notions of what is and isn't good, what is and isn't possible. Let me see past what my senses are telling me. Give me the strength to see this man as the love I know he is, and help me interact with him accordingly. Arthur sat still and took several slow breaths before reaching out and taking the man's scorched finger bones in his hand. It required every ounce of his heart not to recoil at the dry, crispy, foul <laughs> phalanges in his hand. He felt like he was holding hands with a tree branch that had just come through a forest fire. No, that wasn't true. It was worse than that by far, because in addition to the knobby, hard objects in his hand, he could feel the pul pulsing slither of the man's veins beneath the parched skin covering. Give me strength, Arthur prayed again. He must have gotten it. That was the only explanation for why he didn't scream when the finger bones and veins he held moved. He did, however, drop the hand. He was human after all. Was it because he was polite or because he was afraid of whatever entity had moved the fingers? Entity? What was he thinking? This wasn't an entity. This was a man in hideous circumstances. This wasn't a foe to be vanquished. It, he, was a human being worthy of love. You are loved, Arthur said. He could feel the truth of his words, couldn't he? Actually, he wasn't sure. He felt a, he usually felt a flush of warmth and surge of lightness when he said those words, but now, nothing. The man, however, felt something. He must have, because he started to move his index finger. Oh god. Um, at first, Arthur thought his finger motions were random. Reflexes caused by nerves firing indiscriminately. <laughs> but then he realised the finger motion was purposeful. Could you do that again? He asked. He didn't let himself wonder how the man could hear him. The man had no ears, and Arthur didn't want to look into the torch tissue at the side of the man's skull to see if his eardrums and whatever else made it possible to translate vibration into sound were still intact. Apparently the man could hear him, because the finger repeated the motion. Arthur watched closely. It's an F, he said excitedly. <laughs> F in chat. Uh, it's an F, he said excitedly when he realised the finger had just written that letter in the air. Oh! 
the finger stopped. Arthur took that to be affirmation. Just a second, Arthur dug in his satchel and pulled out a small pad of paper and a pencil. Opening the pad, he wrote down F. Okay, I'm ready. Would the finger move again? Yes. This time it traced an A in the air. What's in the name of all that's good and holy are you doing? Oh, sorry. What in the name of all that's good and holy are you doing? Nurse Ackerman yelled from the doorway. Arthur fumbled the pencil and it fell from his fingers. When he bent over to pick it up, he bumped his head on the bed frame. He also inhaled the odour of whatever fluid was draining from the man on the bed. It smelled like a cross between bile and vomit, and Arthur's gag reflex activated. He stood and backed away from the bed, facing the nurse, trying not to vomit. He's communicating, Arthur announced. Nurse Ackerman strode into the room. I can see that, she said. And what makes you think that's a good idea? Well, it's a breakthrough. It's progress. Progress is always good. If you think that, you're dumber than you look. Arthur chose to ignore her. Do you even know what he's communicating? Nurse Ackerman said. For all you know, he could be hexing you. Hexing him? Arthur kept his face blank. But Nurse Ackerman had a point. What was the man trying to communicate? Would it ever be clear? Well, let's find out. Arthur said. We should have called a different priest, <laughs> Nurse Ackerman snapped. Just ignore her, Arthur said to the man in the bed. He sat back down and repositioned his pencil over the pad. Give me the next letter. The finger moved again. Nurse Ackerman gasped and began murmuring under her breath. Arthur wrote down, Z. Nice. Um, okay, he said. Let's keep going. Arthur had written down D." By the time Nurse Ackerman returned to the room. What is that? Fa okay. Um, this time, she wasn't alone. She had two other nurses with her. Both in the same dark blue uniform, the other nurses also wore similar open-mouthed, wide-eyed expressions. They were obviously appalled by what the man was doing. One of the nurses, a round, grandmotherly-looking woman, covered her mouth with a hand. The other nurse, a tanned woman who looked like she spent the weekends mountain climbing, put her hands on her hips and glared at Arthur. He hoped she wasn't going to get aggressive with him because she could take him out without breaking a sweat. They didn't say anything though, so Arthur kept going. One letter at a time, the man spelled out his communication in the air. When he was done, completion indicated by no further finger bone movement, Arthur had a string of incomprehensible letters on his pad. Oh god, what does that mean? Okay. Fazbear enter dissenter. Hmm. Interesting. What did that mean? Arthur frowned at the letters, inserting slashes between various sets. He tried several combinations. Fazbenter dissenter. <laughs> Fazbenter dissenter. <laughs> that, I'm pretty sure that's what I said. Fazb enter dissenter. Fazb enter dissenter. I think I have the center right, he mumbled to himself. But the other parts? He tapped his pencil on his pad. Wait, what if he'd missed letters? It had been hard to interpret the motions of the bony finger. Okay, so what if... Arthur played on with the letters some more, landing finally on FASB ENTER DIS CENTER. Arthur thought back over DIS CENTER. He'd seen that abbreviation before with some of the charities he'd worked on. DISTRIBUTION CENTER. Arthur shouted. It had to be. But what was FASB ENTER? I need a phone book. Oh, entertain- yeah, that, that makes sense. He told the nurses, who remained at the foot of the bed watching Arthur as if he was a li- if, if, if it was a live reality show. I need to look up FASB ENTER. FASB ENTERTAINMENT, the grandmotherly nurse whispered. What? Arthur asked. Quiet, Nurse Thomas. Nurse Ackerman hissed. Nurse Thomas covered her mouth with a plump hand, but it was too late. Arthur processed what she'd said. Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Center. Arthur cried out in glee. This is amazing. He turned to look at the nurses. They were all pale, even the tanned one, and they all stared at him and the man in this bed with obvious dread. This is remarkable, Arthur said. Has he ever done anything like this before? Certainly not. Nurse Ackerman shook her head. You don't understand the forces you're playing with. Forces? Arthur decided he'd had enough of the nurses. He turned back to the man. Let's see, how can you tell me what this place means to you? Arthur thought for a second. 
He considered asking the man to air right why he had just given Arthur the name of this place, but that could take hours, and Arthur figured the man didn't have strength for that. Given that he should not have been he should have been dead a long time ago, lengthy communications didn't seem like a good idea. Plus, as excited as he was, Arthur really needed to leave this room. It seemed to him that the sulphur smell was getting stronger, and now there was a hint of a feces odour wafting up from the bed. Did the man's bowels work? Arthur hadn't wondered before, and he wasn't going to look now. I have an idea, he said, relieved that he did indeed have an idea. He could hear the nurses whispering in the doorway. He blocked them out. Why don't I make guesses about why this place is important to you? When I get the right one, you can either raise a finger or just react so the monitors can pick up. The monitors hiccuped, and Arthur took that to be absent. Uh, absent? To be assent. He threw out his first guess. It's where you used to work. Nothing. You have family there. No, you have unfinished business there. No reaction. You hid something there. That guess made Arthur smile. It was a dead giveaway that he loved mystery and adventure books and movies. <clears throat> um, Arthur noticed the nurses had come further into the room. Now they stood in a semicircle, a couple feet from the end of the bed. Arthur wondered why they were still here. If they thought that he was doing so abhor- abhor- uh, uh, so bad, why didn't they just leave? It was the last place you were before you got hurt. No movement, no monitor reaction. You need something from there. Nothing. You've always wanted to go there. The monitors blipped so infinitesimally. I can say that word, but not right now. Infinitesimally. Yeah, that's not it. <laughs> um, infinitely. Um, that Arthur thought he was imagining it. But what if he wasn't? Is this a place you want to go? The monitors reacted. He can't go any place, sweetie. The round nurse said. He can only go, well, someplace other than Earth. Arthur stood and walked over to the nurses. You mean hell? He whispered. Oh, ho, ho. Um, Nurse Ackerman gave him one sharp head nod. The tan nurse said, well, duh. Okay, okay, so this is about ultimate custom night. And the monitors in the room went crazy. Beeps were sounding so fast, they blurred together into one long screech. Arthur turned back to the man. He suddenly understood. You want to go to this place before you die? The monitors all went silent, completely silent. For five seconds, the only sound in the room was the combined breathing of Arthur, the nurses, and the man. And then the monitors started beeping. Sorry, did I knock my mic? I might have knocked my mic. Um, sorry, I've lost where I am. And then the mo monitors started beeping in a normal rhythm again. Arthur turned back to the nurses. He wants to go to Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Center before he dies. Impossible, Nurse Ackerman said. I have a small theory. Seeing as this is about Ultimate Custom Night, uh, and there's two souls in this body, uh, I think it must have it must be something to do with the fact that Ultimate Custom Night is going on right now to Will, to William Afton, to this to this guy who's who's sat there. Um, but there is something holding him back so that he can't die, and that thing is um, is the one you should not have killed, Golden Freddy, um, and I, I believe uh, uh, the theory. Like, I've just come up with this right now in my head. It's probably not right, but this theory that um, the two souls in this body right now are the one you should not have killed and William Afton, and the one you should not have killed is not putting him to rest. He he is tormenting him forever and keeping him alive in a way, but in hell. It's really hard. I don't know how it would work. I don't know how to explain it and how it would work, but that's my theory right now, and I want to see what you guys think about that. Because I genuinely believe that all of this is about like ultimate custom night, clearing, clearing things up about that. Anyway, uh, let's carry on. Arthur sat in a low slung dark blue visitor's chair in front of a cluttered desk that belonged to the assistant of the assistant of the Heracles. I also learnt that it is Heracles, not Heracles. Heracles Hospital Administrator. Um, judging from the man's boy's age, um, Arthur suspected he was more than two people removed from the person in charge, but that was okay. Arthur knew how to climb bureaucratic ladders. Oh, bu bureaucratic ladders, sorry. So, I'm not sure what you want, the assistant's assistant said. His name was Peter Fredericks. Uh, call me Pete, he told Arthur. Pete's desk was in a corner cubicle in a room of similar cubicles 
nowhere near the Heracles Hospital Administrator's Office. Most of the people in the cubicles were talking on the phone. Those who weren't on the phone were typing on their keyboards. The room was filled with half conversations and half click click of typing. Um, Arthur filtered out the sounds and focused on Pete. As I said, Pete, I want to know if there's anything in the file of the man in room 1280 that indicates why he might want to go to Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Center before he dies. Well, yes, you just said that. Pete scratched the sparse facial hair on his skin. It appeared to be a failing attempt at a goatee, probably intended to cover up the acne there. But I don't know why you want to know, Pete said in a voice that hadn't yet found an adult depth of tone. I want to know because it might help me make it happen for him. The man in room 1280 can't be moved. When Pete said man in room 1280, he looked down at his desk and chewed on the cuticles uh, with great concentration. So I've been told, but nothing is impossible. Arthur replied. Moving uh, him is. <laughs> Arthur braced his hands on the two soft cushion under his butt and maneuvered himself with effort forward in his seat. Pete, isn't the very existence of the man in room 1280 proof that nothing is impossible? If he can be in that room, still breathing, still able to communicate a desire, might it not be possible to fulfill that desire for him? Think about it, Pete. Pete glanced up at Arthur. His face was as white as the walls in the tiny cubicle. Pete was clearly thinking about the man in 1280, and he didn't want to be. He looked down again, and he tapped the very thin file folder on the desk in front of him. An open container of Chinese food tipped against the stack of thicker folders and threatened to spill its contents. From the aroma, Arthur guessed it was a sweet and sour chicken. Well, there's nothing in here. Nothing about a Fazbaren thing. I see, Arthur said. He battled the chair for a few seconds and finally managed to stand. Well then. I'll need to talk to someone who can give me permission to take the man to the Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Center. I assume that's not you. Pete stood, bumped the thick uh, stack of files on his desk and spilled the Chinese food. Yep, sweet and sour chicken. Pete ignored the sticky mess on his desk and scurried after Arthur as he turned to leave. Grabbing the sleeve of Arthur's cassock, Pete said, No one's going to give you permission. We'll see, Arthur said. Oh, Arthur has a plan. Good on Arthur. Uh, Arthur stepped out of the hospital and stood under the portico. He watched mist waft sideways in a steady southerly breeze. He and Ruby would be soaked by the time they got home. Not in a hurry to start his wet cold journey, he scanned the black and silver mottled sky. There were no rays of sun to be seen now. Twilight hovered. Arthur took a deep breath of rain cleansed air. He needs, he'd need a year's worth of such breaths to clear his old factory system from the torments it had endured today. It wasn't kind to think about how, the, how bad the man in room 1280 smelled, but Arthur couldn't help it. After over seven hours by the man's side, he thought the smell might never leave him again. Nurse Ackerman had tried to get Arthur to leave right after the man's communication breakthrough, but Arthur had refused. He spent the next three hours sitting with the man, praying, asking for help. Arthur needed to know if he was simply helping a tortured soul or something else. He never got a clear answer, so in the absence of definitive evidence to the contrary, he, tro he chose to say positive. This was a man who needed his help. Hi, Father. I mean, Father Blythe. Arthur smiled. Mia. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. Mia. Um, Mia, he said as he turned. How was your first day at work? Arthur could probably have answered the question for her. Her ponytail had slid lower on her head and dozens of strands had come loose to fly around her face. She kept blowing one of them away from her nose. Her mascara was smudged and there was a blackest stain on her uniform. It was okay, I guess. Well, not okay, actually. My dad used to say when I asked him that question, Well, Mia, my, Mia, 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 <laughs> Mia, Mia, uh, that's what he called me. All one word, like it was my name, he'd say. Well, Mia Mia was a day. It was a day. So I guess I had a, de a day. It was a day. I'm so confused. <laughs> Arthur nodded. Sometimes all we can do is have a day. Mia tilted her head and studied Arthur. I think you had a day too. Maybe? <clears throat> Arthur nodded. That I did. A group of boisterous men in soccer uniforms converged on the portico. They were mud and grass stained and appeared to be celebrating a victory as they charged down the hospital entrance. Arthur guessed one of their teammates has gone injured. Mia stepped closer to Arthur when one of the men whistled at her. 
Arthur ushered her back to the friendly panicle hydrangeas they'd stood next to <laughs> that morning. Morning. Arthur couldn't believe he'd spent the whole day at Heracles. Peggy would be furious with him. He'd called her to have her reschedule his other appointments for the day. Now he was going to have to tell her to reschedule the rescheduling. Have you been here all day? Mia asked. I was just thinking about that. Yes, I have. It wasn't my plan, but... Man plans. God laughs. Mia giggled, then covered her mouth. Oh, I hope it's that's not like an insult or something for a priest. <laughs> Arthur laughed. No, not at all. They stood in silence and watched the cars coming and going under the portico. They both coughed when a loud diesel engine belched exhaust three feet away. Arthur's stomach growled and he realised he hadn't eaten anything but a protein bar since he'd left the, re the, the rectory. But Mia looked like she wanted to say something, so he lingered. Plus, he was just enjoying being in relatively fresh air looking at a lovely human being. Father Blythe? Yes, Mia. Can I ask you something? Of course. Mia looked around and stepped closer to Arthur. Her hair smelled like ammonia, <laughs> but her breath smelled like peppermint. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, Father, do you believe in evil? Arthur raised an eyebrow. I do. Do you think there's evil in there? Mia lifted Arthur's shoulder in the direction of the hospital. Arthur frowned. He believed evil was everywhere, but so was good. The eternal battle was waged daily all over the world. Why do you ask? Mia wrinkled her nose and twisted her mouth. Can I ask another question? Arthur nodded. Did you spend the day with someone in the hospice wing? Arthur's frown grew deeper. What was she digging for? Well, telling her he was on the wing didn't reveal any confidences. Y yes, I did. Why? Mia opened her eyes wide. Arthur could almost hear her brain cells shifting gears. I don't know about the nurses on that wing. I mean, besides me, but I don't feel like I'm really one of them yet. It's the others, you know, Nurse Ackerman and Nurse Colton and Nurse Thomas. Ah, so it's just that, at the moment, a, a zippy red shorts car whipped into the driveway under the portico and beeped its horn. Mia's face lit up when she saw it. That's my boyfriend. She blew the, uh, she blew the good-looking young man uh, behind the wheel of kiss. She turned back to Arthur. I'm sorry, I need to go. Of course. Mia took a step forward toward the red car. But Mia... She turned. Some people have closed minds. Always keep yours open. She looked at him. Her face as solemn as she had seen it. As he'd seen it. I will, she promised. Bye, Father Blythe. Bye, Mia. Arthur watched the sports car whiz away, and he thought about the man in room 1280. Uh, his attempt to get answers in the hospital administration office and his brush off by Pete made it clear that Arthur wasn't going to find out why the man wanted to go to the Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Centre. But no matter, that wasn't Arthur's business, it was just his job to ensure the man got there. However, that was easier said than done. Pete and Nurse Ackerman weren't the only ones at Heracles Hospital who thought such a trip was impossible. Arthur had a battle ahead, he was just he just hoped he was on the right side of it. They're gonna team up, th team up, um... <clears throat> Yeah, they're definitely going to teen up. Oh my god, I keep saying teen up. I still can't read. <laughs> right. Mia's second day of work started weirdly. Unable to find her fellow nurses when she arrived at the nursing station for her assignments, Mia just shrugged and went from room to room checking on her patients. Mia didn't love taking care of hospice patients because she knew... Sorry, she had too much empathy for the families. She knew they often suffered even more than the patients, but she did find the work satisfying when she did it right. She wouldn't have minded the new job so much if it wasn't for the other nurses and the other thing. Mia shook her head and strode briskly down the hall. Popping in and out of rooms, she checked IVs, adjusted pillows, filled pitchers and emptied urine collection bags. When she reached the last room she had been told to attend to the day before, room 1200, she wondered why the rest of the doors on the strangely long hall were closed. She lingered in the hallway just outside the last open door. A storage room was across from her, its door slightly open. Then Mia saw a shadow flit past our opening. Sucking in a deep breath, Mia tiptoed across the hall, making sure her crepe soles didn't squeak on the tiles. She hesitated outside the storage room. She was about to open the door and investigate when she heard noises. She knew immediately that she'd found her fellow nurses. Mia was about to walk in and ask what was going on, but then she heard the word, kill. Oh, okay. 
Okay. Mia went as still and as silent as the floor uh, she stood on. She took a stealthy step to the wall and pressed against it as she put her ear to the silver, or to the sliver, to the sliver? Yeah, yeah, to the sliver, sorry, of an opening at the hinge side of the door. I suppose we must, Nurse Thomas said. Someone has to do it, Nurse Colton said. I don't have a problem with it. It's not like murder because it's not human. It's extermination, said Nurse Ackerman. We're doing nothing more or less than ridding the hospital of vermin. Oh, I think it's much more, Nurse Thomas said. Don't you? Killing rats or cockroaches is good, of course. But ridding the world of evil? That's more than pest removal. That's a calling. It's, well, it's heroic. Nurse Thomas' voice had climbed to a new level of self-righteousness. Heroic? Mia's fingers twitched. She wanted so bad to throw the door open and ask what these three odd women were talking about. Well, I agree with you both, Nurse Ackerman said. But others won't see it quite the same way. Technically, he's one of our patients. They were going to kill a patient? <laughs> Mia looked around. What should she do? They don't pay me enough to call that thing a patient. Absolutely, Nurse Thomas continued. Mia dropped her ponytail and returned to listening. Then we're agreed, Nurse Ackerman said. The women must have been nodding because they went silent. I'll be the ones who... I'll be the one who does it. I'm head nurse. It's my responsibility, Nurse Ackerman declared. We'll do whatever you need us to do, Nurse Colton offered. I'll need morphine, Nurse Ackerman said. I can fudge the tracking, said Nurse Colton. We can take a little here and a little there from the other patients, Nurse Thomas added. We have to hurry, Nurse Ackerman said. We don't know how quickly that priest will move. He's determined enough to get the hospital to cave, and we have to get this done before the thing in room eight in room 1280 can leave the nurses must have nodded again and now mia could hear faint rustles from inside the storage room she decided she'd better go pushing off from the wall mia took a step and that's when she saw what she'd been trying to convince herself she hadn't seen before a little boy slithered out from the storage room he came sideways through the slim door opening mia slapped a hand over her mouth to stifle a scream she gritted her teeth exasperated with herself she had just seen the same reaction when she'd seen this boy the day before, but he was only a little boy, a cute and playful little boy, with his curly black hair and rosy cheeks. The boy's adorable factor was diminished, slightly, by just two things. First, he wore a cheap alligator mask. Oh my gosh, no! Are you kidding me? He has curly hair and he's wearing an alligator mask uh, that covered his forehead and his eyes. The gator's mouth rested on the boy's impish nose. Second, the boy had a toothy grin, just a little too devilish to be endear endearing, one notch past acceptable on the scale of mischief. But he was a little boy, and little boys like to look like this. Mia's cousin, Lucas, was a case in point. That child always, wanted, always looked like he was up to no good, and he usually was. So why did this boy make uh, Mia want to scream? Before she could answer her own question, the boy winked at her and scampered down the hall. Mia turned to watch, but realised the nurses were about to exit. Mia darted toward the open door of the last patient she'd attended before loitering outside the storage room looking for the boy again, but he was gone. When Mia burst into room 1200, Mr. Nolan, the room's occupant, looked up from his crossword puzzle. Hello, Nurse Fremont, he said. How fortuitous. What is another word for hell? Six letters. Starts with S. Shades, Mia blurted, wondering why the word was on the tip of her tongue. Mr. Nolan, whose gaunt face was haunted by the sunken eyes of the soon-to-be-gone-from-this-world, slowly wrote in his puzzle book, Exactly right. You're an angel. <laughs> if shades actually- I thought that was a different word for glasses. <laughs> <laughs> it took two days for Nurse Ackerman to acquire enough morphine for her task. At least she hoped it was enough. She wasn't actually sure what enough was in this case. Normal treatment dosages versus overdoses have never been relevant to the man in room 1280. Nothing about him was normal, so there was no reason to assume medication would affect him the same way as it would other humans of his weight and size. Allowing for this, Nurse Ackerman and her colleagues gathered enough extra morphine to kill an entire wing of evil patients. She figured she'd start with what she thought might work and add it to it, and add to it as necessary. As soon as she had a quantity of morphine that gave her at least some level of confidence in the success of her mission, she didn't waste any time. 
a friend who worked in admin had informed Nurse Colton that Father Blythe was being relentless in his campaign 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 to get the man in room 1280 to Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Center. Nurse Ackerman strode down the long hallway, her rubber soles smacking the tiles. Her thoughts about Father Blythe made her footsteps even louder than usual. She clenched her fists. She was so angry with the man. How could Father Blythe be so clueless and blind? Couldn't he see he was being duped, being used as a tool for wickedness? Wasn't the very place the man wanted to visit a clue? Nurse Ackerman had researched Fazbear Entertainment, and she was alarmed by what she had found. The company's distribution centre was its central hub for all Fazbear related toys, costumes and decor. It shipped to restaurants and speciality and retail stores. She looked at some of those toys and costumes and they were unsettling to say the least. What better container for pure malevolence uh, than some creepy toy? Nurse Ackerman suspected that whatever was inside the man in room 1280 had a plan. A plan that needed to be stopped. Checking over her shoulder one more time, Nurse Ackerman picked up her pace. She hoped she'd had enough time to finish the job at hand before Nurse Fremont uh, finished her lunch. Nurse Fremont was the other challenge the nurses had to handle. The timing of her addition to the hospice wing roster was unfortunate. She was just a little too perky, a little too energetic for comfort. Nurse Ackerman had given Nurse Fremont a little test on her first day, talking about the man in room 1280 and Father Blythe in the break room while Nurse Fremont ate. If she'd turned and asked what they were talking about, they'd have included her, but she'd just eavesdropped, and Nurse Ackerman didn't trust eavesdroppers. At the doorway to room 1280, Nurse Ackerman paused. She looked behind her. The hallway was empty. It was time. Putting her shoulders back, Nurse Ackerman entered the room. She even considered closing the door, but she couldn't do it. None of the nurses had ever closed themselves inside room 1280. Quite frankly, they were afraid to. She only needed a minute anyway. Crossing to the loathsome thing in the bed, Nurse Ackerman took out her first glass vial of morphine and thrust it into the needle end of her syringe. She ignored the flusters of excitement that danced over her skin. It wasn't that she was eager to kill, it was just that it would be such a relief to rid her hospice wing, her hospital, her world of this stain upon mankind. With a steady hand, Nurse Ackerman injected the first of the morphine into the man's IV port. She watched the heart monitor, its rhythm didn't falter. She had suspect suspected that this would happen. Smoothly, she pulled out the second vial. That's when she heard the giggle. Ooh. That, that short sentence right there, that's, that is amazing. Uh, Nurse Ackerman pivoted towards the door, but no one was there. Stepping away from the bed, she went to the door and looked out into the hallway. Had Nurse Fremont finished her lunch? The hallway was empty. Then Nurse Ackerman had heard another giggle, and it, this time, it was behind her. A blast of cold rushed down her spine and tightened into a vice grip into her bowels. Slowly, as if about to face a wild animal she didn't want to spook, Nurse Ackerman turned. She didn't know what she expected to see. She was prepared for literally anything. How could she not be? Anyone who had been in man, anyone who had the man in room 1280 as a patient would have to be ready for anything. But she saw nothing. Everything was just as it had been when she entered the room. Even so, she stood next to the man for several moments to be sure, watching him to see if the, if she could discern a change. She couldn't. Well, that wasn't true. She did notice one change. The smell in the room was worse now than it had been when she first came in. It had intensified, as if someone had been fiddling with the hospital's thermostat and had allowed the room to heat significantly. The odour was ghastly. She'd better get on with it. Nurse Ackerman still held the second vial of morphine. So she quickly inserted her syringe and emptied it into the IV port. Again, she watched. And again, nothing. Nurse Ackerman straightened her spine and pulled the rest of the morphine vials from her pocket, eleven more. She laid them on the edge of the bed in a tidy row. She'd inject them all if she had to, one right after the other. She wasn't going to wait for the result. Reaching for the third vial, she heard the giggle again. Her hand stopped in midair. The giggle came from right next to her. A little black-haired boy stood by her side looking up. He was grinning a grin so feral that it acted like a scythe. Si siphon? Siphon? Don't know, sorry. Extracting the strength from Nurse Ackerman's limbs. She felt herself start to crumple toward the floor, and she caught herself on the edge of the bed just in time. He was just a little boy. Why was she so afraid? 
He ran out of the room, and Nurse Ackerman tried to steady her racing heart rate. She needed to get herself under control so she could return to what she needed to do. But her mind, her memories, wouldn't let her find calm. Instead, she was transported, wholly against her will, into her past. She was deposited right she was deposited next to the bed of her dying son, the one who had left this world and had taken him with every smile Nurse Ackerman might have, might ever have smiled. Feeling the agony agony <laughs> as if she was living it. Nurse Ackerman experienced for the millionth time that moment when her son's death had reached into her heart and had torn it all apart. She hadn't always been this shell of a woman, but Elijah's death... Is that how you say it? Elijah? I actually don't know. I've never tried to say that name before. I'm really sorry. I'm very bad at pronouncing things. <laughs> but his death had carved her out, leaving a barely functioning person to find a place um, among living things who tortured her with... Uh, reminders of the life she had once shared with her son. Even though her heart was frozen, she had become a hospice nurse to help others who had to walk in her shoes. Stop this right now, she admonished herself. She didn't have time for this misery. Nurse Ackerman pushed aside her past, along with the question of who the little boy was and why he was here. She also boxed up the puzzle of why he was so terrifying. One thing at a time, she told herself. Once again, she reached for a vial. Before her fingers could close around it, though, a child-sized shadow flashed in front of her. As it streaked by, all the vials flew off the bed and hurtled toward the floor, where they shattered on impact. Morphine puddled innocuously on the tiles. So this is this goes with my theory. If that is the one that you should not have killed um, from Alternate Custom Night, then he is trying to keep uh, William alive, right? He's trying to keep William alive and torture him instead of just letting him go and letting him have a peaceful death. I see. I mean, I, I think I see. <laughs> I don't know if, if I'm being really dumb here, but I think that's what's going here. Nurse Thomas's plan was simple because Nurse Thomas was simple. A lover of growing flowers, cooking a family, large fattening dinners and needle-pointing Bible verses, Nurse Thomas, Beatrice to her friends, <laughs> had become a nurse because she also loved people, simply loved them. She wanted to serve them however she could. These truths about Nurse Thomas were a little counter to where she currently was and what she was currently doing. Right now she stood outside of room 1280 holding a pillow that she intended to use as a weapon. But really, Nurse Thomas's goals were all congruent, uh, she told herself. What she was about to do was an act of love, an act of love as pure and simple as she was. Beatrice was doing this for the same reason she did everything every day. She was doing it to help people. Nurse Thomas looked over her shoulder. She was alone. Just because she was doing this to help didn't mean she wanted to be seen doing it. No one besides Nurse Ackerman and Nurse Colton seemed to understand. Pausing to say a short prayer outside of room 1280, Nurse Thomas hugged the pillow and then opened the door. She ducked her head as soon as she was in the room. She always did this in room 1280. It was a way of seeing well enough to do what she needed to do without having to look too closely at, at what was in the bed. She didn't want to look at what was in the bed because it had it was the most grotesque thing she'd ever seen. A macabre go col oh my god. A macabre conglomeration of writhing slime and fire branded uh dr dros dross <laughs> the man shaped mass of bone and tissue in the bed would literally made Nurse Thomas's eyes burn, as if she was looking at a solar eclipse without shades. This effect was so immense that she'd even intense that she'd even tried wearing sunglasses in this room to see if they'd help, which they didn't. Breathing through her mouth because Nurse Ackerman was right, the smell was much worse than ever, Nurse Thomas approached the head of the bed. Giving the pillow one last squeeze, she held it in two hands, out in front of her. She knew that Nurse Ackerman and Nurse Colton both thought her idea for killing the thing in his bed was silly. Maybe it was, but sometimes the easiest solution was the best one. Morphine hadn't worked, that was for sure. Nurse Thomas and her fellow nurses had spent an hour the night before discussing the little boy Nurse Ackerman had seen. Both Nurse Thomas and Nurse Colton had seen him too. They even got Nurse Fremont to admit that she'd spotted him. Nurse Thomas didn't think Nurse Fremont had told them everything about what she'd seen, but she had told them enough. Earlier today, Nurse Thomas had overheard a couple orderlies, um, what? <laughs> orderlies? Orderlies? Um, talking about how people were seeing a little black-haired boy all over the hospital. Ooh, okay. 
The mystery of the boy wasn't necessarily related to room 1280, or was it? After Nurse Fremont went home, and after handling over the hospice wing to the, sh to the swing shift, the three nurses had shared coffee in the cafeteria and discussed a question that was even more important than the boy. Who do you think the shadow was? Nurse Thomas had asked Nurse Ackerman as she tried to ignore all the food smells in the room. She was hungry and couldn't wait to get home to cook macaroni and cheese and green bean casserole. I think it was... it. Whatever's inside that man. How'd it get out? Nurse Thomas asked. I can't explain any part of this. Nurse Ackerman's voice was so loud it startled several nurses and doctors sitting nearby. Forks clattered. Someone dropped a glass. She immediately dropped her voice to a whisper. It doesn't matter. What matters is we need to try again. That's when Nurse Thomas volunteered her homespun little plan. She'd smother the man in room 1280 with the pillow. <laughs> yes, ultimate plan. Nurse Ackerman had wanted to try again with morphine, but Nurse Thomas convinced her that the man in room 1280 or whatever was inside that, the man in room 1280 would be ready for that. They needed to take him, or it, by surprise. So here she was. The previous night, Nurse Thomas had practiced. She'd done a bit of research and she discovered it took about three minutes to suffocate someone with a pillow. She had to find out if she could hold a pillow forcefully over something for that long or even longer. Learning from Nurse Ackerman's experience, Nurse Thomas figured that if normally lethal doses of morphine didn't kill the thing, suffocation would take an extra effort too. Nurse Thomas looked pillowy herself, but she wasn't. Hours of cooking, cleaning, gardening and needlework had given her an unexpected bo upper body strength. The strength came in handy when she did her pillow experiment on a doll she'd bought for a niece. She had no problem holding the pillow over the doll for seven minutes, although her muscles were burning a little by the time she was done. She'd received the strength she needed now, she wasn't sure. Nurse Thomas took a step toward the bed. She paused and listened, but there was no giggling of the kind Nurse Ackerman had described. Apparently the boy wasn't around. Tightening her grip on the pillow, Nurse Thomas marched to the bed and shoved it down hard over the man's face, or at least over where his face should have been. Nurse Thomas's muscles were tensed, poised, and ready for anything. Yet nothing happened, at first. Then the pillow started filling with blood. It came through the middle of the pillow and soon began spreading outward, seeping inexorably toward Nurse Thomas's fingers. But she didn't let go. She was focused on the end result. After six and a half minutes, the monitor's steady beep, beep, beep had picked up its pace. Then glory be, after another minute, it shifted to the sustained tone of a flat line. She was doing it. Just a few more seconds should be enough. The pillow was almost fully saturated with blood. And now... Oh. <laughs> and now Nurse Thomas noticed the sickly green fluid was coming through the pillow as well. She gagged but kept pressing. That's when a shadow darted in front of Nurse Thomas and tore the pillow from her grasp. Before she could even think about trying to retrieve it, the pillow ruptured, its contents ejecting into the room and all over her. Sticky, odious blood went into her mouth and up her nose. Putrid slime flew into her eyes and bits of cloth and foam stuck to the fluids that sliced over her skin and colgulg- Are these even words at this point? Colgulated in her hair. Nurse Thomas didn't make a sound, but the monitors did. They shifted from a steady flatline tone to a stable, even rhythm. They can't kill him. Nurse Thomas fainted into the middle of the sickening mess on the floor. Okay, okay. Arthur was getting frustrated. He didn't often get frustrated because he believed in a universal timing, but that timing seemed to be a little off right now. It was now five days since the man in room 1280 had been able to communicate with him. Since then, Arthur had been back to see the man daily, although he'd only stayed a couple of hours each time. The rest of the time he was at the hospital, he was in the administration offices trying to get someone to listen to him. What harm could it do? He said over and over to at least a dozen different people. He simply couldn't understand why moving the man in room 1280 was such a bad thing. Either he'd survive the experience and get whatever it was he wanted from his visit to Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Center, or he wouldn't. And if he didn't, well, Arthur couldn't help but think that that would be mercy. The hospital administration didn't agree. They also were distracted. It seemed that the whole hospital was abuzz about repeated sightings of a little dark-haired boy wearing an alligator mask. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Um, dozens of people had seen the boy, but thus far, no one had been able to talk to him. Wait, it just hit me! Old Man Consequences. Old Man Consequences was like an alligator, right? Oh my god. How has that only just hit me? 
The police had been called in to find the boy and figure out where he belonged, but none of the officers ever spotted him. Every time the boy was seen, and officers rushed to the location reported, the boy was gone before the officers arrived. Meanwhile, patients and staff had seen the boy in locations all over the hospital. Apparently, a janitor even saw him in the hospital's basement, near the backup generators. As far as the hospital administration and the police could determine, no one was missing a child who had matched his description. Because no one had spoken with the boy and no one had been able to grab him, people now were wondering whether he was a ghost, a ghost in an alligator mask, of all things. But that wasn't Arthur's business. He had his own problems to solve. And today he was taking a breather from arguing with hospital personnel. He was having lunch with Mia. Here I am, Mia called out as she wove her way through the wooden picnic tables in the outdoor eating area of the cafeteria. Cafeteria? Cafeteria. The tables were set up on pinkish stone pavers within a larger patio lined with stone planters filled with orange and yellow mums. A half dozen dark-eyed juncos and a couple sparrow sparrows um, hopped among the flowers. <clears throat> the sun has reasserted its dominance <laughs> assert your dominance uh, over the sky and it was lighting up all of Fool's Jewel's colours. Turning the trees surrounding Heracles, Heracles, sorry, Heracles Hospital into masterpieces of brilliance, reds, yellows and oranges, only the faintest of breezes made the tree branches sway and the leaves on the ground gamble about. It was a glorious day. Mia's bright presence made it even better. I hope you haven't been waiting long, Mia said. Not at all. Truthfully, Arthur had been here for 25 minutes, but she was only 15 minutes late. I also hope you didn't bring your lunch because my boyfriend made these amazing propolone and corned beef sandwiches. Oh, you're not a vegetarian, are you? Or can you eat corned beef? Is it kosher or whatever? Arthur smiled. I'm not a vegetarian, he said. Oh, good, Mia replied. She pulled out two thick sandwiches on hoagie rolls, <laughs> uh, both tightly wrapped in plastic, and handed one to him. So how's it going with admin? She asked as soon as he she'd taken a bite and washed it down with soda. It's not, admitted Arthur. Take, taking the fact that he'd run into Mia every day she'd been at the hospital as a sign of encouragement, Arthur had finally told her he was trying to get permission to take a patient out of the hospital to replace the patient had requested to visit. Mia had surprised Arthur when she responded. Oh, the man in room 1280? How did you know? he asked. I overheard Nurse Ackerman and the others talking about him, and they caught me listening, so they told me about him. I haven't seen him yet or anything. They say I'm not ready for that. I think I'm more ready than I think I am, but whatever. I'm plenty busy. She took a bite of the sandwich. I'm not sure you're ready either, Arthur said. He hated the idea of this cheerful girl having to see. But wait, that wasn't very kind, was it? The man couldn't help what he looked like. Arthur bit into his sandwich and immediately knew why Mia was so crazy about her boyfriend. The man was a sandwich saint. <laughs> this is amazing, he said. I know, right? She grinned. They both chewed for a few seconds. When Mia finished chewing, she said, The man in room 1280's that bad, huh? Arthur shrugged. I've overheard them talking about other things too, Mia said. Who? he asked. Nurse Ackerman and the others. Mia was quiet for a minute, so Arthur prompted her. What other things? he asked. Mia bit her lower lip, then she waved her hand. It doesn't matter. She took a drink of soda. You've heard about the boy, right? Arthur laughed. How could I not? Everyone's talking about him. I saw him, Mia said. Was she bragging? Really? At least four times so far. Always wearing that silly mask. Arthur settled in with his sandwich and listened to Mia describe the curly-haired boy with a devilish grin. He had to admit mild curiosity about the child. Arthur himself hadn't seen him, but that was okay. You know, Mia said, you could use the boy to your advantage. How? Arthur wasn't a fan of using anyone, much less than a little boy, but he figured he might as well hear what Mia had to say. He found her voice to be as comforting as one of Peggy's hot toddies on a cold night. Well, the whole thing is causing a mass of paperwork for the people in admin. It's a nightmare to document all the sightings and coordinate with the police, I'm sure. Why don't you suggest you're going to follow him around and bug the heck out of them unless they let you take the man to where he wants to go? I used to do that when I was a kid. If you just keep asking, keep pestering people when they're really busy, they eventually say yes just to get rid of you. Works like a charm. She laughed and bit into her sandwich. Arthur thought about it for a second. That's not a bad idea. Mia grinned. 
She had a piece of lettuce caught between her two front teeth. On her, it was charming. <laughs> okay. Um, was that really required? Nurse Colton had a plan she was sure was better than those of Nurse Ackerman and Nurse Thomas. It had the advantage of being both simple and sophisticated, and it should also be lethal, she expected, assuming she wasn't thwarted by the mysterious shadow that had derailed the actions of her fellow conspirators. But unlike Nurse Ackerman and Nurse Thomas, Nurse Colton expected the shadow to intervene. She had a plan to stop it. Nurse Thomas had been homesick for two days. Neither Nurse Ackerman nor Nurse Colton knew whether the sickness was physical or psychological. Obviously anyone who'd experienced a monstrous deluge of foul bodily fluids like those that had drenched Nurse Thomas had a right to get a little hysterical. Fainting seemed an in so sorry. Fainting seemed an appropriate action. Nurse Colton didn't begrudge Nurse Thomas at all for just escaping consciousness for a while. Nurse Colton and Nurse Ackerman had both been masked, gowned, and gloved when they had cleaned up the de detonated pillow. They had also put camphor on their upper lips to dampen the smells. However, they had both gagged re repeatedly for the hour it took to clean the room, and Nurse Thomas. What was the shadow? That was the discussion the three women had at Nurse Thomas's house the previous evening. They decided it was an extension of the thing in the bed, or what was inside the thing in the bed. This was why Nurse Colton thought she knew what to do about it. She had some experience with this sort of thing, and she felt pretty good about her plan. Whereas Nurse Ackerman was cut from her emotions and Nurse Thomas was too enslaved to hers, Nurse Colton thought she was the perfect balance of heart and brain. She felt and felt deeply, yes, but she also had a depth of reason that the two other women lacked. She had to have this balance. Nurse Colton had been on her own since she was 16. When her parents died, Nurse Colton had decided to forego foster care. Forgo, forgo, forgo foster care. She had instead run away, found a woman who made fake IDs and gotten a job on a cruise ship, a job that came with free room and board. Over time, she'd saved up enough money to pay for nursing school. Now she was here because people like her had lost people like her parents. It was only right to use what she knew about it to help others. On her way down the hall, to room 1280. Nurse Colton saw the little boy run into the storage room. She still had no idea whether he was real or supernatural. She suspected the latter, but if he was some kind of ghost, she didn't know what to make of him, and she didn't know how to make him go away, so she figured she'd deal with one mystery at a time. At the door of room 1280, Nurse Colton stopped and set down the tote bag she carried. Looking back down the hall, she pulled out eucalyptus oil combined with a carrier oil. She put a dab of the oil mixture above her upper lip. The strong aroma, she hoped, would block out the contemptible stink in the room. After one more look down the hall, Nurse Colton pulled the plain white pillar candle out of her tote. She stepped into room 1280 and she set down the candle. Then she pulled out another candle and set it a couple feet from the first one. One after the other, she placed candles around the perimeter of the space. Once she had the candles in place, Nurse Colton pulled the lighter from her tote bag and she me methodically lit every candle. After the candles were lit, Nurse Colton closed her eyes and imagined expanding the candle's light until it filled the entire room. Then she turned and looked at the man in the bed and she said, This room is filled with the light of good. No shadow can enter or do mischief here. So, oh, okay. I, I, like, I like what she did there. It's not going to work though, is it? Uh, she stood very still to be sure her intention was strong enough. Yes, it felt right. Nurse Colton believed in the power of intention and human will. Both had helped her survive the loss of her parents and build a life on her own terms. Both would serve her now. She was sure of it. Good. It was time. Nurse Colton set down her tote bag and looked at the man in the bed. Unlike Nurse Thomas, Nurse Colton preferred to face the ugliness of life head on. Yes, the man's fire-blighted bones and nearly calcified insides filled her with revulsion, but she could handle it. Now she was going to rid the world of it. Nurse Colton pulled out a syringe. It held no drug. It was a syringe of air. She figured if the thing in the bed could breathe, it could die of an air embolism. 
Leaning forward, Nurse Colton began injecting the air into the IV port in the thing's forearm. She had no doubt she'd succeed because she knew she was standing in a protective circle. This circle was so strong that even if the shadow, whatever it was, was inside the circle, then she cast it. The circle would stop the shadow from doing what it wanted to do. As she began to depress the plunger on the syringe, her protection circle failed. Lacerating the air in front of Nurse Colton, a shadow swept across the syringe. The syringe leaped from her hand, spinning just once before shooting like an arrow toward Nurse Colton's throat. Oh my god. Stabbing deep into her skin just above the collarbone, it vibrated, sending jitters through her neck. Nurse Colton knew if she didn't grab the syringe immediately, the air in that syringe was going to kill her, so she reacted instantly, jerking the syringe from her neck, only to have it snatched from her again. This time, she held up her hands in surrender. The syringe fell to the floor and snapped in half, then a hot, musty blast of air rushed through the room and extinguished every candle flame. The candles flew back, flew back and smacked the walls. Nurse Colton had never had her intentions so violently defied, and she was rattled, but she wasn't going to show it. She looked at the vile mass on the bed. We'll find a way, she said. A giggle came from the outside hallway. <laughs> uh, Nurse Colton rushed to the door, and she ran right into Nurse Fremont, who stood like a statue, staring down the hall. Ooh. He went that way, Mia told Nurse Colton. Who? she asked, looking stunned. Little boy. I'm beginning to think it's not a little boy, Nurse Colton admitted. Mia nodded. Me too. The nurse stood in silence, looking down the hall. Then Mia asked, What just happened? You saw? Mia nodded. She wasn't afraid. Nurse Colton cocked her head and studied Mia for several moments. You're curious, she concluded correctly. Mia nodded again. Okay, come in. Nurse Colton went back into room 1280. Mia tried to follow, but she had to stop in the doorway and cover her nose. Mia liked to keep lists. She kept lists of the best things in life, best experiences, best sights, best case, best smells, best sounds, that's hard to say, etc. And she kept listing of uh, and she kept lists of all the worst things in life. Three of the smells on her worst smells were list were rotten eggs, dead bodies, because she had unfortunately once been the one to discover the body of an elderly woman in an adjacent apartment without family to check on her, and a skunk's spray. The smell in this room was worse than Mia's three worst smells combined. Oh, she said. Try this, Nurse Colton handed Mia a small container of essential oil. Mia sniffed it and then rubbed it some of it above her upper lip. It was better but not great. Still, Mia stepped into the room. She didn't know what she'd expected to see, but it wasn't this. What was this? The poor, poor man, she whispered. Nurse Colton looked at the bed and sighed. But then she said, yes, but the man isn't the problem. Mia glanced at Nurse Colton and returned her gaze to what lay in the bed. Mia had never been squeamish, in fact, she kind of enjoyed the gory stuff. She had looked at the elderly cadaver, cad cadaver, that sounds like a, like a spell, she discovered, stared right at the mass of maggots and thought, cool, it was nature at work. But this, this wasn't nature, this was the exact opposite of nature. It was a violation of the very idea of nature. Neither a skeleton nor a man, this brittle bone container of decaying organs and tissue still somehow managed to sustain, sustain li enough life to result in the brain activity Mia could see on one of the monitors. That was just wrong. Fundamentally wrong. It's what's inside that, th that is the problem, Mia said. Yes, Nurse Colton said. Mia thought about the conversation she'd heard. The conversations about even and extermination. Now they had context. Turning, Mia met Nurse Colton's direct gaze and nodded. I think I understand. Mia was a genius. Arthur had felt like a spoiled child following the administration staff around, asking over and over for permission to take the man in room 1280 to Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Center. He couldn't, however, agree with the res argue with the results. In spite of the vociferous and numerous objections voiced by the nurses on the hospice wing and even from others in the hospital when they signed a petition, Arthur received a call late in the evening before telling him he could take the man in room 1280 to Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Center if he came in and signed a multitude of papers absolving the hospital from any responsibility for whatever might result from the trip. So once again, Arthur pedalled towards Heracles Hospital. Today he was wearing full rain gear because there was no arguing with the colossal churning storm clouds that dominated the sky, foreshadowing. 
or pathetic fallacy, uh, not a single ray of the sun's light was finding its way through a black and grey cloud stack that made it seem more like twilight than 10.10 in the morning. Rain f began falling as the hospital came into view. Arthur kept his head down, navigating by the markings for the bicycle lane at the right edge of the driveway. Every car that sped past sprayed Arthur with water and buffeted Ruby so her tyres wobbled a little on the pavement. Arthur was relieved when he glanced up and saw he was almost to the portico, but then his feet fumbled with Ruby's pedals. Had he just seen what he thought he'd seen? Glancing up at the portico, taking in the majesty of the building's vine-covered facade, facade um, and its intricate statuary, he was sure he'd just seen a child's head peek out from behind the stone cerebrus. Cerberus. <laughs> um, sorry. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Arthur braked, wiped his eyes, and stared him through the gauzy rain curtain separating him from the hospital. He squinted, focusing as in intensely as he could on Cerberus and the top of the columns flanking the portico. No, nothing was there. He must have imagined what he'd seen. The, I think this is going to answer a few questions about kind of like the ghosts in, in FNAF. Because they're not really ghosts because they're physical things. It's, it's like the Ballora in, uh, in the last book, you know, where she's kind of invisible. But uh, she's affecting, she's affecting like leaves and stuff. So um, yeah, it, it, it might answer some things about ghosts. Who knows? Uh, all that talk about the little boy. It had put the idea in his mind, but he didn't think he'd imagined it. Arthur tried to take a last look, but the rain curtains turned into solid walls of water pounding the earth as if Mother Nature was trying to obliterate an enemy. Now Arthur could see nothing but rain, so he stood on Ruby's pedals and got both himself and his poor, drowned bicycle under cover. Ten minutes later, still dripping water wherever he went, because he carried his wet rain gear with him, Arthur sat in front of a very different desk from all the desks he sat in front of during this campaign for the trip to Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Centre. This wasn't the desk of some low-level paper pusher. This was the desk of someone with power, in this case, legal power. Arthur sat in front of the desk of Carolyn Benning Graves, Heracles Hospital's head attorney. Miss Graves had much nicer chairs than Pete and all the others in the administration office. Arthur was quite comfortable in a burgundy leather wingback chair. You understand, Father Blythe, that any damages resulting from this patient transport, be they property or personal, shall be wholly and completely your responsibility. Arthur nodded. I understand. His stomach did a somersault. What if something went wrong? Arthur adjusted his, Arthur adjusted his altitude. Attitude. Oh my god, not his altitude. <laughs> Where was his faith? He and the man in room 1280 would be watched over. The attorney pushed a stack of papers across the clean polished surface of her mahogany desk. Please read through these agreements, sign where indicated initial were specified. Arthur started to lean forward. Not here, Father Blythe, Miss Graves said. She made a motion and a thin, well-dressed young woman appeared and picked up the papers. Please go with Miss Webber here. She'll take you to a place where you can read and sign. I'm afraid I have another appointment. Arthur dutifully vacated the wing-back chair, feeling victorious. Okay. Mia hovered in the hallway outside the hospital's legal offices. She'd been told Father Blythe was still signing papers giving him the authority to take the man in room 1280 to Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Centre. In spite of the papers, she'd hoped she'd be able to talk to him into giving up the idea. Leaning against the wall, Mia nodded and smiled at everyone who went by, but she didn't really see anyone. Her mind wasn't in this hallway with her. It was reviewing what had led her to this place and this time and this mission. Mia hadn't really understood why the only job she could find was on the hospice wing at Heracles Hospital. She was highly qualified and had excellent references. She should have been able to get a better position. In fact, she'd been feeling pretty resentful then that she was stuck with that, that she was stuck with what she'd gotten. If it wasn't for a boyfriend continually reminding her that the job was a stepping stone, <coughs> oh, uh, stepping stone, she'd have been pretty miserable. But between his encouragement, his wonderful sandwiches, and her own naturally optimistic nature, she'd been reasonably content here. Content? Content? Content here. <laughs> Except for being creeped out by her fellow nurses on the hospice wing and their disturbing, hushed conversations. But now she understood them. Oh boy, did she ever. 
Mia also understood why she had gotten this job. She was needed here. Why, hello, Mia. Mia focused and realized Father Blythe was standing right in front of her. What are you doing here? Mia smiled as she watched Father Blythe juggle a stack of papers, orange rain gear, and his bright red bicycle helmet. The rain gear dripped on leather... on leather... leather Blythe's... Father Blythe's black leather shoes. For some reason, he always smelled like coconuts. <laughs> Actually, I'm here to talk to you, Father, Mia said. She glanced around the busy hallway, then she looked down at the hall to a small writing... Uh, waiting area. Could you come with me a second? Father Blythe glanced at his watch. Peggy's going to be meeting me out front with the church van. Um, it's wheelchair accessible. I'm going to trade her ruby for the van. Then he looked into Mia's eyes. But okay. M Mia took Father Blythe's arm and led him down the hall. She smiled at everyone as they went, noticing that several nurses gave Father Blythe disapproving frowns. Oh. Uh, in the waiting area... <coughs> Uh, in the waiting area, Mia sat in one of the tan plush chairs and motioned to the one next to it. Father Blythe sat beside her. What is it, Mia? You seem troubled. I am. She looked at Father Blythe's warm brown eyes. He had such a kind face, such an open face. She could see that he'd known suffering, but she could also tell that he was resolute in his intention to see the good in everything. He had one of the, those mouths that curved upward, even when his face was expressionless. He was designed for seeing light in the darkness. Realising that he was waiting for her to speak, Mia looked around to be sure they were alone. She leaned as close to Father Blythe as she could without being weird, inhaled, and then said in a rush, Father, I know I gave you advice about how to get permission to take the man in room 1280 out to hospital, but you can't take him. You just can't. The man in room 1280, he can't leave this place. I can't explain why I know this, but I know it. He can't go where he wants to go. You can't take him. The other nurses are right. I know they were lunatics. I admit it. I did. But now I understand. They're right. There's something in that poor man. There's something in there. And you can't take it where it wants to go. You can't. It will be devastating. Even catastrophic if you do. I don't know how or why, I, but I do know it. You have to believe me. I... Mia stopped. She realised that she could gush forth another thousand or even million words and Father Blythe wasn't going to change his mind. It was right there on his face. Lips pressed into compassionate regret. Thick grey brows drawn together, crinkles drawn in at the corner of his wide-set eyes, slightly weak chin tucked. These were all telegraphing what was going to come out of Father Blythe's mouth. Mia, he said when she'd finished her case, I'm so sorry, but I have to take this man where he wants to go. It's his last request. Just because it's his last request doesn't make it a good one, Mia attempt attempted futilely. Why is this so important to you? Father Blythe asked. Mia had no logical answer. She wasn't about to explain what she'd seen in this hospital room. She knew how crazy it sounded, and she couldn't lose this job. But beyond what she'd seen, all she had was a feeling, an intuition. Maybe it was a premonition. It just is, she said finally. Father Blythe set down his rain gear and bicycle helmet. He tucked the papers under his arm, and he took Mia's hand. Mia, I've lived long enough to see the kind of evil that exists in our world. I haven't seen it all, by any means, but I've seen more than enough to understand that my glasses-always-full attitude has no basis in earthly reality. I should be jaded by now, I suppose. I should be pessimistic, ready to see the worst. But I'm not. I'm not because I chose to... I chose not to let the past colour the way I see my present. I chose to ex I choose to expect in every moment to find what's good. But what if you don't? Then there's always the next moment. And what if there isn't? Mia could hear the fear in her voice. She brushed away the tears that threatened to spill. Father Blythe breathed in and out slowly. Then I'll move on to whatever my journey holds next for me, I suppose. That's all we can do. That's all I'm trying to do for the man in room 1280. Mia swallowed and nodded. You won't change your mind. I'm sorry, but no. Mia stood and Father Blythe gathered his things. May I hug you, Father? She asked. Of course. Oh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> um... They hugged, and she tried to pour into Father Blythe the inexplicably huge amount of warmth she felt for him. Or was it worry? They separated, and he said, Bye, Mia. I'll see you again soon. Bye, Father, she said as he gave her a little wave and headed down the hall. Th th this, this line, this one line, I'm telling you, <laughs> it it is predicting or no not predicting it is foreshadowing 
that uh, something's gonna happen and they're never gonna meet each other again. That is their last moment together. I am telling you right now. <clears throat> okay. We're, we're near the end. We're near the end. Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Center was a massive collection of reddish and whitish buildings that Arthur couldn't believe he had never noticed before. Looking like long, flat, metal-sided blocks hazard, haz, haphazardly placed and clustered by a gargantuan child, the buildings must have been here at least 20 years. Low slung and dotted with narrow windows, every one of them needed paint or at least a good cleaning. Arthur was pretty sure the buildings had been bright white and bright red when they'd first been built. Along the sides of most buildings, slanted drives led to cracked concrete loading docks. Even the big rig trailers tucked into at least a dozen of these docks looked like they'd been in service for a good long while. Some were rusted, many were dented, all were dirty. Admittedly, it was a dreary day, but Arthur was sure that even in bright sunlight, this distribution centre would look like it needed a lot of TLC. The address of the distribution centre, which Peggy had gotten for Arthur along with instructions of getting there, turned out not to be a building, but rather a small empty guardhouse and an open gate. Once through this abandoned entry, Arthur didn't know exactly what to do. He realised now that the man's designation of the Fazbrough Centre um, was almost like picking Iowa as a place he wanted to visit. What specific part of this place did the man want to go to? Arthur glanced in the rearview mirror at the sheet enshrouded bundle in the wheelchair, locked into place behind the van's passenger seat. He still wasn't used to seeing the palpitating dried organs uh, and veins in an upright position. He also wasn't used to the smell. Although he tried to talk himself out of it for the trip from Heracles Hospital for Fazbear Entertainment, Arthur was sure uh, the man smelled worse with every mile they travelled. The van was filled with a grim stench of sulphur, faeces, decomposition, blood and bile. Ever since the man in room 1280 had been transferred from his bed to the wheelchair, he'd been leaking blood and vicious black fluids. Ugh. The treacly mixtures were now soaking the sheet around the man and pooling on the van floor. Arthur knew it was going to take hours to clean up the van after this trip. In spite of this, the man sat upright in his seat. He was strapped in, but his head wasn't drooping. Of course, he had no eyes, but his eye sockets were just directed ahead, as if he could see exactly where they were. Feeling less and less sure about what he was doing, Arthur told himself to stop judging the poor man based on his appearance. He cleared his throat. So do you know where you want to go? Arthur didn't really expect a response, but he got one. The man raised one of his crusty finger bones and pointed it in the direction that seemed to indicate the largest building in the Fastbrae collection. It was also the building, Arthur noticed now, that had a large covered courtyard leading to a glass fronted wall. That was probably the main entrance. Arthur realised he should have called ahead to get permission to bring the man into the distribution centre, but maybe his failure to do so had been unconscious. What was that old saying? It was better to ask for forgiveness than for permission? Something like that. Arthur didn't want to another battle, like the one he'd had to fight at the hospital. To that end, Arthur decided not to head to the main entrance the man had indicated. I'm going to find a side entrance, I think, Arthur said out loud. Something more private. Are you alright with that? The man didn't move. But Arthur thought he could hear a sloppy per percussion emanating from the man's chest. Was Arthur hearing the man's heartbeat? Arthur suppressed the shivers that started at the top of his head and did an arpeggio down his neck to his spine. Arthur put the van in gear and pulled it around to the side of the main building. The van's tyres made fizzing sounds on the wet pavement. Arthur wondered how he'd transport the man into the building without getting him wet. Somehow, dousing a body with barely their skin, with barely their skin, didn't seem like a good idea. What? Uh, I don't know. I, <laughs> I rushed through that sentence. I don't think I took it in. As soon as Arthur turned the corner of the big building, he saw the solution to his problem. The size of the building had van. This side of the building had van-sized loading docks under an overhang. Ask and ye shall receive. Arthur said, smiling. He said his prayer of thanks for the help. At the far end of this row of loading docks, a couple of husky workers wearing black bra back braces and scowls um, loaded boxes into a dirty white van. They paid no attention when Arthur pulled the church van parallel to the platform at the opposite end of the docks. This should work, he said to the man. Of course, he got no response. Jumping out of the van, Arthur took in a cleansing lungful of fresh air. Well, not fresh exactly. The air smelled like grease and solvents, but at least it smelled better than the air in the van. Arthur opened the side door, removed the wheelchair and jock-eyed it into a position on the ramp. 
Try not to be too prizzy about it. Arthur touched the blood-stained sheet and adjusted it to better cover the man. He had nothing to wipe his fingers on, but he ignored the issue and wheeled in the man into the building. Inside the roll-up door openings of the loading docks, the building revealed itself to be the heart of the Fazbear Entertainment Distribution Center, stretching so far into the distance that Arthur couldn't see the end of them. Floor-to-ceiling shelves held stacks and stacks of boxes and plastic enclosed packages. Peggy had told Arthur that Fazbear Entertainment created parts and costumes for animatronics used in restaurants and other venues. It also created costumes for humans to wear and various toys and other merchandise related to their most famous characters. Interesting. Okay. Arthur assumed that that's what was all in all the boxes and packages. It also explained the faded murals on the pale yellow walls. The murals depicted a variety of outlandish animal characters of questionable purpose. Despite their cheery appearance, Arthur couldn't be sure if they were intended to be friendly. In front of the shelving area, a series of conveyors took boxes and packages on journeys through the building, journeys that would probably end up near the loading docks. A few workers monitored the v conveyors while others drove forklifts down the rows of the shelving area. A tall man with red hair wandered about, carrying a clipboard, but he wasn't looking his way. The building was surprisingly quiet. Only the muted clatter of the conveyor, the hum of the forklift mo motors, and a few shouts and thumps broke up the cavernous hush of the place. Well, here we are. Arthur turned to look at the man, and then the man started to convulse. Several thoughts tangled in Arthur's head as he watched the bones and organs and tissue in the wheelchair shake so uncontrollably that some of the man's rib bones cracked. When blood flew and tissue cinders began spewing, Arthur thought, they should have let me bring a nurse, and what should I do? Why did I sign all those papers, and please guide me? Arthur leaned over the wheelchair just as the man collapsed into a mound of bone and an, indescrib an indescribable mass of fried human parts. At a loss, Arthur began to pray silently. But before Arthur could get through two words of his prayer, the man's remains heaved. Then they burst like a nightmarish egg blowing open to disgorge new life. Expelling rank smelling um, sticky black blood and a tar like substance in a frightful spray all over Arthur's and the building's smooth concrete floor. The explosion of bone and veins and organs happened in an instant. In that instant, Arthur saw a void in the remains gape like a portal to hell itself. Then he was frantically wiping nauseating fluids and slimy body bits from his face. As he did this, he saw the man's body tumble from the wheelchair, and Arthur knew the man was dead. Instinctively, Arthur began praying again, but as he prayed, he heard something that wiped even the thought of prayer from his mind. He heard a rush of pattering footsteps, little sp sprightly footsteps capering away toward the shelving area of that building. What was that? Arthur wiped his eyes again and looked around. At first, all he saw was the man's remains. For the first time since Arthur had gathered the courage to look at the man, all the exposed insides were still. Then Arthur's gaze lands, landed on a trail of tiny footprints that were stamped in the man's charred blood and fluids. He followed the trail and saw the footprints continue away from the man, etching the floor in the man's blood-like fearful hieroglyphs uh, marking the way. The way to where? The man had moved on, but something hadn't. Father, is everything okay? A man's voice pitched high in shock, asked Arthur. Arthur turned. The speaker was the red-headed man with a clipboard. He stared at the floor, his face blanched, his eyes wide. Actually, no, I don't think everything is okay, Arthur said. For the first time in his life, he was sure of it. Ha. Huh. Okay, and that's it. That that is it. That that is the book. Huh. Okay. Interesting. Um. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm very. I, I'm confused. To be fair, I'm very confused about that ending. Um, what his his body parts were just scrambled all, all over the floor he just smashed into his body parts what was the the thing like why did he need to go to the Fazbear distribution center thingy um, why like there's a lot of characters because there's shadows there's that boy I think they're connected obviously 
but then there's also the man itself and, and there's two souls inside of the man or whatever I am very confused kind of but this is one of the one of the best one of the best stories I think I quite liked it I quite enjoyed it <laughs> um, what it means I have no idea I have no idea what it means um, please 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 in the comments below tell me what you think about this what theories do you have about it um, also kind of clear me up on the ending because I'm a little bit unsure what really happened um, but Arthur seemed to have had his first traumatic experience in his life um, I don't know I, was, like good story good story not one of my favorites but it was pretty good and it, it felt very connected to the FNAF lore it felt very there and I was wondering how Scott would have done like a story about Ultimate Custom Night to clear things up about that game and if this is about Ultimate Custom Night he has done such a great job like honestly <laughs> um, he's, he's very good he's very creative I think um, but this story this story took a few unexpected turns anyway what it, what can it tell us? Tell me in the comments. What did you think of the story? Um, and yeah, <laughs> that's it really. Um, I will say I am going to go back all the way to the first book for my for, for the next audiobook. I'm going to go back to the first book uh, into the pit, and I'm going to start reading all of the Stitch Wraith stories because I haven't done that, and I know people want it. Uh, and I also haven't read the Stitchway stories, which is why I'm very... I haven't made any videos on it or anything, even though it's a hot topic. But, um, yeah, I'm going to start that soon. So look out for that. Make sure you subscribe if you enjoyed this. Uh, give this video a like. And, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I will see you all later. Thank you so much for watching. And goodbye.